What's up, y'all? This is Preston Perry, and thank y'all for tuning in to Apologetics with Preston Perry. I know I've been gone for a little while, but I'm so excited to be back. And I'm just gonna get right into the video. In this video, we're talking to a couple of elders. Let me just explain to you how this conversation came about. One day I was walking down the street and I came across two Mormon elders and we began to have a conversation. Uh, I couldn't have the conversation as long as they wanted me to have the conversation. And so they offered to come to my house. And so I said, sure, you guys can come to my house. When these two Mormon um, elders came and came to my house, um, to my surprise, they also had an older couple with them. And so here I am with four LDS members and it's just me and we had a respectful um, I feel like dignifying conversation about our fundamental differences, uh, and I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Um, if you're new to this channel, throughout the conversation, I'm going to be doing some interjections and explaining some things that might be a little confusing. Um, but other than that, man, enjoy the video. Peace. Just before we jump into it, the Book of Mormon is another book of, of scripture comparable to the Bible, like it says in the beginning, but it just takes place in the ancient Americas. So, let me show you something. Um, so if the Bible was, was written over in like the Eastern part of the world, mm -hmm. you know, Christ was, you know, born, lived that, and, and died in this. That I have researched, I, re I researched that, um, that you guys, uh, believe that, um, God visit the prophet Joseph Smith in the mm -hmm. Americas. Yep. That was in the Americas. Okay. Okay. Was it, was it God or an angel? It was, uh, first, it was the very first time it was God and Jesus Christ, you know, side by side talking to him. Okay. Okay. And then later on when he, when Joseph Smith was, was guided to, there were just some of these like, gold plates that were buried in the ground. Okay. Um, and then that kind of, um, that was led to him by angels appearing to him. Oh, wow. Um, so okay. Like leading and guiding him and kind of the reason for that was long story kind of like the spark notes version of it is that there was a need to restore or to bring back some some lost truths so as part of that you know god bringing back the full truth on the earth it was part of his revealing the book of mormon to us so that we can have it alongside the bible to have the fullness of the gospel when you say restore what do you mean meaning like think about like an old car like an old car that's been run down is like not been used for a while. It used to be like in good shape. Okay. It got run down. It's so it's like if we were to restore, to bring back Christ's gospel to what it once was. Oh, wow. Okay. When, when Christ was on the earth, he taught his gospel and he taught it in this pure form because like how God has always done that throughout history. But we believe for a, a time there was a kind of a great falling away from, from the truth because people got wicked and persecuted the the leaders of the church and everything so there was a need to bring back the fullness of the gospel and god yeah. did that in, in a way of you know calling another prophet so let me quickly explain to you what's happening here first i just want to say that like i said before that when these lds mem members or elders i should say that i know they're young men but they're actually elders on their missionary journey when they came over i didn't know that they were coming over with um, an older couple. And so one, I wanted to be very respectful of them. I wanted to not alarm the older couple who came probably to watch their back or make sure they don't get taken advantage of. I wanted to not alarm them and make them think that I was trying to take advantage of them. But I also wanted to give them honor, dignity, and respect as well. And so I'm doing my best to try to let them talk and let them explain their worldview and their, and their position. Um, but also, too, what we see here at this point is he's explaining to me the role of Joseph Smith, the prophet who they believe God used to reveal another testament of the Gospels. And so one thing I think that they fundamentally understood what I was trying to explain um, was they think that, you know, uh, I merely don't understand why Joseph Smith is being used as another prophet. And that's not necessarily even my beef per se. Uh, my, my beef with the LDS church is not that they believe that Joseph Smith is used to, to, to kind of like um, give us the truth. My, 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 my issue with the LDS church is they believe that God used Joseph Smith to restore something 
that God had already came to bring into completion. Essentially, they believe that the word of God in some way had fallen away and needed to be restored. When the book of Matthew says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not. And so if a 19th century prophet comes and says something prior to what the word said before then, that's what I have a problem with. And so what I'm explaining uh, in this next clip is if Jesus, the, the one who we have been waiting for, right, the Messiah came to do a work that men couldn't do, how were men able to undo what God came and did? And so that's what they essentially believe. They, they essentially believe that this work that Jesus came and finished that men undid it by killing off the apostles and some of the word had been lost. And it was like, no, like all of these men that they explained prior to Jesus coming, I, I agree with. I believe that these men were shadows to come and they were shadows to come because they were all pointing to the great Messiah, the Emmanuel, God in the flesh who will come and take away the sins of the world. He came to do a work that men couldn't do. And because he's God, he's able to sustain that work. And men did not allow that work to fall away. And God did not allow men to make that work fall away. And so that's what we're going to be explaining um, in the upcoming conversation to come. Now, okay, so I got a lot, I told you I asked a lot of questions. Yeah, you're good. I'm very, I'm very inquisitive and, and I don't, I don't, I don't mean this to disrespect you guys, but I, but every, I ask older people questions a lot because I just feel like they have a mountain, like a, like a whole mountain of wisdom. And so, yeah, and I, That's why I, we brought them. yeah, yeah, I would love to ask both or whatever. Yeah. The Bible says in Matthew that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away, not even one iota. And so when you say, some things were falling away. What do you mean by that? Because God says, when I read that scripture, I interpret that scripture to mean that God will keep and sustain his word, that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away, that God will sustain it. And so how, how would you guys reconcile that? Yeah. So do you recall what happened after Christ was crucified? Do you remember yeah. what happened to his apostles? Yeah, they all went and hid. <laughs> they did, but after that, what happened? Uh, a lot of things happened. I mean, um, John and Peter, they were preaching the gospel, um, and some of the Roman officials came and heard that they were preaching the gospel after they healed a crippled man, and, you know, they were thrown in prison. And the Bible says that, you know, the Holy Spirit came over them, and they was given, you know, uh, more boldness to, to speak the truth with God. Um, you know, a lot of them were killed. Uh, because of, of preaching the gospel, preaching, preaching, you know, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, it's, it's not only a lot of them. All of them. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. So, all yeah, of them. Judas yeah. Judas took his own life. Judas took his own life. The right. other eleven were all killed. Yeah. When Christ was on the earth and he organized his church with the apostles, right? He gave them authority to preach on his behalf. Right. That authority we call the priesthood. So when Christ was, was crucified mm -hmm. and his apostles were ultimately killed, okay. that priesthood left the earth. Even though the word didn't leave, the authority that was in that group of people was eliminated. Really? Does it say that in scripture? What does it say that in scripture? There's a... Go ahead. Yeah, so there's a couple of places. One that comes to mind is a prophecy from the prophet Amos. Uh -huh. Old Testament, he says that um, in verse 11, he says, and 12, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east. And they shall run to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. So there's one place, and then in the New Testament, Paul prophesies that, before like the coming of second coming of Christ, there will be a falling away first um, in, in second Thessalonians. So there's uh, kind of a couple of places where it kind of prophesies that there will be that falling away. Uh, okay, I, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to, uh, I would love to go there. What, what, what yeah. scripture is that? The Thessalonians one. Thessalonians. Because um, I'm trying to see where it says that, 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 that the word, because if, if that is true, I, I, I definitely want to find that. That the, cause 
I, you know, what do you guys think about the Matthew scripture where it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not? What do you think that His means? His word did continue. Uh, in fact, there were many people over many, over a long period of time that had the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned to you that our family was Lutheran. Okay. okay. You're not Lutheran anymore? Oh, of no. course, of course you're not. Exactly. Um, so we were Lutheran. So anyhow, Martin, um, yeah, Martin Luther. Um, we actually went to the church where he nailed his proclamation because he felt that the church that he was going to, while they were preaching from the Bible, maybe their interpretation of the Bible wasn't correct. Hmm. So there was a church in Werms, Germany, where he nailed his, his proclamation on, onto, the, onto the door there to proclaim that he didn't believe that what the church was preaching was 100% accurate anymore. So his followers then, they created another church, the Lutheran Church. You had the Baptist Church created. So... A lot of people felt like maybe what was being preached at the time wasn't 100% what Christ would have been teaching. And so they started another religion or another church. And what was that What was that church? Well, like Baptist, Calvin. Um, there were many, Wesley. Um, they started a number of different churches. This would be like in the 1500s or... Uh, a little after. Uh, well, from my knowledge, um, like I said, I didn't grow up in church, and so I, I won't sit here and act like I'm well-versed in all of the denominations. But um, from my knowledge, um, a different denomination is not another religion, right? This, this mm, is just, okay. right? And so, um, you know, I have Reformed friends. I have Charismatic friends. I have Lutheran. I have a couple Lutheran friends. And um, we, we all believe in the key foundational essentials of the gospel. That is that um, that God sent his son into the world to dwell amongst his own creation, to die for the sins of the world. Um, he lived as a man. Um, he came to live a life that we can live on our own. And he died a death that we all deserve. And at the end of his three year missionary journey, he died on a cross for the sins of the world. Um, that we might know him and be reconciled back to, to the Father. We believe that we're saved by grace through faith, that it's not of, uh, not of our works, at least any man can boast. Right. Um, and so, you know, we, 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 you know, there might be core differences um, in the, in the non-essentials of these different denominations, but the key foundation of the essentials, that is Jesus is God in the flesh and he came to dwell amongst his own creation. This is what we believe, that we're saved by grace through faith. Um, it is not of our works. Um, and that, you know, uh, and that the gospel is that God came to dwell amongst us. And so th that's, that's what we believe. And so whether I meet a Lutheran, or whether I meet uh, uh, reformist, whether I meet a Pentecostal, uh, if they believe in the key foundational essentials of the gospel, I believe that they're Christian. And so they're not a different religion um, just because they have a different denomination, right? Because, you know, I think a denomination is just people who live all the parts of the world. We're not going to um, all worship in the same way, but we all worship the same God, if that makes sense. And so, you know, when you have different people from all over the world, you're going to have different denominations, different worship styles, different the way you sing hymns. Some people sing hymns, right? but the key foundation essentials are not changing. So I don't I, 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 I don't know about the Lutheran church, about, you know, what they what they thought was wrong. But I believe that if I believe in in the in the Christian church, if you believe in those things, you are you are a Christian. That's what I, I believe. Does that make and, sense? And, and for the most part, that's, that's exactly right. Um, you've probably heard of a lot of the conflicts that they had in previous years. You go back to in England and, and uh, Scotland, that area where the Catholics and Protestants started killing each other hmm. because their beliefs were different. Yeah. You know, even though they were Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, they hated each other. Yeah, yeah. And they killed each other, persecuted each other. And that has happened. 
even though people are oh absolutely Christian. even 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 to this day i mean you have people in the name of christ right right um persecuting other christians i mean it's on social media i mean you have quote unquote christians bashing other christians and that's the reason why the bible says that we know if we're a tree by the fruit it produces. that if i tell you that i'm in the nba but you never saw me with a basketball you shouldn't judge you know, the NBA, you should judge me. <laughs> right. And so and so, uh, of course, they're going to be people in the name of God saying that they're Christian. But if they, the Bible says they don't if they don't if they don't represent what I what I what I mean in my word is not a reflection of Christianity it's a reflection of them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so uh, a quick question, though, you know, I, you know, you, you guys say that 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 the christian church has fallen away and, and uh what does that exactly mean like what do you mean by that it's a great question so if we look back in in the history of the world you know god has has worked through his like the same book of like amos it says that god works through prophets you know, okay like man of, you know appointed by god with you know the authority to preach the gospel and administer the ordinances of the gospel like like baptism and things like that so God will always call a prophet to teach the gospel. For example, with, with Moses, God called Moses to be a prophet to you know, deliver the Israelites. And then eventually the disp dispensation of Moses ended and there was kind of that, a brief falling away. I have a little diagram actually in my back of my book of Mormon. It's like Adam was like the first dispensation of the prophet. And then eventually people got wicked and the dispensation of Adam ended and then Enoch the same kind of pattern. Noah, Abraham. So God has always worked through prophets. And, you know, when Christ came to the earth, he was obviously much more than a prophet. He was the savior of the world. And he gave his, a, he called 12 apostles with the authority. So the common thing here, here is the, the authority, or we call it the priesthood, is on the earth. So what do you guys believe that Jesus, because I, I, I like this little graph. I think that's really cool. Right. I, I believe that, that Adam, Enoch, Noah, Moses, Abraham were all shadows to come, right? Right. So they were this before, was before, before they Christ. All prophesied they all Christ. prophesied, right? Yeah. Of, right of the yeah. of the of the great coming Messiah, and the Messiah came to do what these people could not do. Right. Correct. To be the savior. To be the savior. Correct. And so when Jesus came and did what they couldn't do, uh, in in which way was his work not sufficient enough for the church for the for the for the for his work not to not to be Falling away. So it wasn't that Christ's work wasn't sufficient, because Christ is obviously more than sufficient for all of it. But after you know Christ, you know, died and went back to the Father, you know, he completed his mission. He called those twelve apostles, and we talked about how they all got killed off, right? But those apostles had the authority to to preach the gospel and to teach it in the correct way. But eventually, the apostles were killed off, you know, all of them. So there was that that falling away we talk about. Um, well, 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 even if they were killed off or they died of old age, God knew that they would die eventually and they would have to like leave the earth. They wasn't going to live forever. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my point is like like if if Christ came to do a work. Right. And so I believe and maybe I need to I don't maybe I need to get an understanding of who you guys believe Jesus to be, because I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that he's God in the flesh. And so he came to uh, not merely do a work but to do what these men couldn't do which was to fulfill them all yeah. to, to fulfill the law of moses Absolutely. and to bring his word into completion mm -hmm. and so if, if if god came you know how can we then reconcile that you guys are saying I, I'm, I'm really trying to get an understanding yeah. that the word what i'm about to say will tie it all together okay so after <laughs> you know christ and the apostles were were killed off because christ's work is forever God is not going to leave us in this state of great apostasy. So then we believe that after the gospel was restored and then they called Joseph Smith to fill the, the vacancy of like having a God always working through prophets. So mm. this will always be continual. And there's a promise that, you know, after Joseph Smith, there's, there will always be prophets and apostles with the proper authority, you know, because of Jesus Christ. Um, that will be sufficient until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So Christ is the center of it and he makes everything possible. We learn that, that God works through his prophets to preach the gospel and to have you know, the authority to do so. So does that 
kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah, but when I, I, I yeah, so that, that make, I, I'm following you, but I, when I read scriptures like, um, for, for example, Hebrews 4.14, where it says, seeing now, that we, seeing now that we have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of Man, who has passed through the heavens, it says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is tempted in every respect, just as we are yet without sin, therefore uh, come to the throne of grace with boldness that we might find mercy and grace in our time of need. When I read scriptures like that, uh, it shows me, and correct me if I'm wrong, it shows me that Jesus came to be the the fulfillment of of the law, Mm -hmm. but he also came to do what men couldn't do, which was to fulfill the law of Moses so we can have direct access to him. And so when I, I think what the writer is highlighting there is Jesus' incarnation um, to us feeling free to come to him. And so when Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, he came, he passed through the heavens and he lived um, as, a, as a man amongst us. And when he died, he said he'll give us his Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. And so what I'm trying to reconcile is how do you guys... How would you guys say after Jesus came, the great high priest, why would somebody have to come after him? So the, it's not like another Christ filling his role. No, 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 I, didn't, not- I, I, know, I know that's not what you're saying, but what I'm saying is if Jesus is saying, I'm the great high priest who has passed through the heavens, I wasn't just born here on earth. I was a great high priest who was passed through the heavens. Uh, for we do not have a high priest who was unable to sit. So basically it's highlighting the fact that God became like us. He became man like us. He came from the heavens, right? Um, All of these people came before him, Abraham, Isaac, or whatever, but we know that Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, right? Letting us know that before all of these men were, I was, I existed, right? Forever ago, he's eternal, he's God, right? And so if God came to do a work, why would another man have to come after him? Why is he? Why, what, what makes us think that he's not sufficient enough to uphold his word and to uphold his work here on earth? Let, let me pose a question to you. Why did God need the prophets before Christ? Well, I think that's a good question. I think, and I, I, I love this conversation. Thank you guys for having this conversation with me. I think God has, has revealed to, to us in the scriptures that he has always used man to help fulfill his will but not in relation to our salvation, right? These people were just a shadow of what was to come. And so before Jesus came on the earth, there, he used men to point to who will come. Jesus came, right, to fulfill what men could not do, right? And once Jesus came to fulfill what, what, what men could not do, then he gave us his spirit here on earth. And after that, he will use men to continue to draw him to us, um, to draw us to him, but in, in, re- in relation to our salvation and the finished work of Christ and his preserving of his word, I feel like I think the scriptures in Matthew when it says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not. I think that's what Jesus is saying. And so God is always going to, God has, and I think he will continue to use men to help fulfill his will. But there's some things men can't do. And so when Jesus comes, I don't think anybody can come and and, 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 and and fulfill something that has already been fulfilled. That so that's what I'm trying to reconcile. Okay. Jesus came and did the All work. Right. So I, I think what we're trying to say is you're exactly right. Jesus came in the meridian of time and was the focal point because he was the Son of God. He was crucified, he atoned for our sins so that we can, if we repent, return to live with him. And no other person could take over that role. You're right. What we're talking about as far as the prophets are concerned is more of a communication and direction. So Heavenly Father brought or had prophets on the earth ahead of Christ Mm -hmm. to not only prophesy of Christ, but also to be the vehicle of communication from God to man. Right. That continues after Christ. Yeah. There's there's a need for God to communicate to man, and so the the approach that he used was through prophets, and what we believe is that that needs to continue through prophets in the current days. Well, I, I definitely believe in, to, in, 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 in modern day prophet, prophets. Um, you know, that after Jesus came, you know, uh, that, that God will, I, I think, 
the word prophecy means to reveal the, the nature of God, to reveal the word of God, right? And so if I, if I open the text and um, teach God's word, that's a form of prophecy, right? That's correct, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> right, right, right. But, but it's not a prophet, it, yeah. it's prophecy. Prophecy, right. right. I mean, we're on the same page. I, I think the, the point that I'm trying to make is though God will use men as prophets, um, that's one thing, but I think for, 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 for us to say, and I'm trying to reconcile this idea that what God, what Christ did on earth, another man had to come and correct. No. Not, or, or, or I guess correct is the wrong word, that God's word had fallen away or, need, or something needed to be restored his after a, Jesus. His authority was lost, not the word. The authority that God gives to man to speak on his behalf was lost. Well, 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 well when you say not the word, um, in, in some ways the word was, right? Because the Book of Mormon is a New Testament of the gospel, right? Good point. Because um, that's what it says, like later on the book, it another says testament. another testament. Yeah. And so, and so what, you're, what, you're, what you're essentially claiming is, is that the, and I'm, I'm not trying to argue, I'm really trying to understand, is that the canon- You're inquisitive, I love it. Is that the canon wasn't closed and that God's word wasn't necessarily complete or had been tampered with, right? Because I, I, I did some research on the LDS church. Um, I think, you know, one of, the, one of the prophets says that all of the Christian professors are corrupt and needed to be restored or something like that, right? And so I'm trying to reconcile if, Christ came to do a work, which I believe is the finished work, the Bible calls the finished work of Jesus Christ, right? That, that, that he wasn't just some mere man. He told, the, he told the, the, the Pharisees before Abraham was, ego eimi, I am, meaning he existed into eternity's past, right? That he came to do what men cannot do, that this word is finished, that I came to bring into completion what we see in the Old Testament, which was the law of Moses. Then you say that it was tampered with and it kind of fallen away and now it needs to be restored. I'm just trying to reconcile. It's not God not merely using prophets. It's that if Christ came to do a work that men couldn't do, how, would, how, how, how was men allowed to tamper with a work that he came that men couldn't do in the first place? And so this is when I, so when I read scriptures like Matthew, uh, Matthew, when it says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not, I think this is what God is essentially communicating to us, is that the word will never pass away because Christ came and finished it. And so also, too, like when I think about, you know, uh, 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 something being another testament of, 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 of the scriptures, I'm trying to understand that because if, if the canon is closed, and, and God's word has been revealed through the person of Jesus Christ. Who's to say that um, Joseph Smith, mm -hmm. who's to say that, how do we know Joseph Smith is a true prophet? How do, we, key. how do we know? So that's where we come in as missionaries, is we help people, you know, study and read and, and ponder and, and pray about the, the Book of Mormon, you know, a fruit of of, the, of Joseph Smith, because he didn't write it, but translated it. So when we help people come to know that Joseph was a, a prophet, we do that by helping people gain a spiritual witness that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God by the power of the Holy Ghost, like you said. How, how, do, how, do, how, does that, how, do, how does that happen? I'll show you the, there's a promise in the Book of Mormon that says, that talks about how you go about that. Um, so even well, if you want to- While open, he's looking for that, let me just give it. you a little context of what the Book of Mormon is. Um, so there was a fam it, it covers a period of time of about a thousand years. So there was a family in Jerusalem who were commanded to leave Jerusalem mm -hmm. about 600 BC. Okay. Okay. They left Jerusalem and came to the Americas. Okay. Okay. I've been to a number of interesting, you know, archaeological sites such as Tikal and in Mexico City. And, and I've stuff traveled like the world too. Have you? Yeah, yeah. I love those sites. Yeah, you know, yeah. Because you see these wonderful civilizations, but you think, where did they come from? Right. 
And so this is somewhat of an explanation as far as where they came from in Central and South America. Um, it covers that period of time up until the birth of Christ. It includes the birth and life of Christ while he was in Jerusalem. When he was crucified, he shared with his apostles and said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them too must I bring. He referred to his disciples as his sheep because he was the great shepherd, right? Yeah. So he was talking of other sheep, other people that he needed to bring as well. After his resurrection, he came in the Book of Mormon. Then you'll see where he came to the Americas to visit his people. So you interpret that sheep to be other prophets or other people? Other people, okay. Other, yeah, other people that believed in him. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so it covered that period. He came to visit them and taught the exact same thing that he taught in Jerusalem. So if you read those sections in the Book of Mormon, you'll think, wow, that's over here too. Yeah. It's another testament of Christ. Yeah. And then it goes on for another 400 years as they have wars and contentions and things like that. So anyhow, the Book of Mormon is that period of history, but it's in the Americas. And it contains also the, the story of when he came. When Joseph Smith? No, when he Jesus. came, when Jesus came to, to the Americas Jesus after came. he was resurrected. So immediately after his resurrection. So like year 33. Okay, but, but, it, but it says that in the Book of Mormon, right? That's in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, yeah. And so my, my, I guess what I'm trying to understand is how do we know that, because I think. And he's going to tell you how you can know. Okay, because from my understanding, everything kind of hinges on Joseph Smith being a true prophet, right? Because if he's not a prophet, we, we don't know, right? Mm -hmm. Or we can't know, right? So if we don't receive a witness, the Book of Mormon is the word of God from the Holy Ghost, which if you open to page 529, page numbers will be on the inside. In the inside? Yep, like right top, there, top, top in the middle. 529. So... Okay. Yeah, so when we come to when we learn that the Book of Mormon is the word of God, we can know that that first off that you know well not first off, but the that Joseph Smith was a prophet, because if he wasn't, then how in the world would he be able to translate a book in, from reformed English reformed Egyptian into English with a third grade education? It was by the power of God that he translated it. So if we know that the Book of Mormon Pause, time out right there. Did y'all repeat what he just said? That's one of my beefs as well. And that's one thing that we have to watch out with when people come and say that they believe in a true prophet. The evidence of them believing that Joseph Smith is a true prophet is about the signs and wonders, not by him keeping the word of God and the word of God proving him to be right, right? The proof that Joseph Smith is a true prophet is that he was able to translate some ancient text to English. But the Bible tells us what? That men will say in the last days, did not prophesy in your name, did not cast out demons in your name. And God will say what? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Notice how the Bible did not say that men will say, God, I thought I cast out demons in your name. God, I thought I prophesied in your name. No, it says I did these things that men actually would do signs and wonders. Right. But that does not mean that they are true prophets, because even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Even Satan has the ability to give men um, um, things. Right. Which is the reason why Satan offered Jesus all of the, the, the riches on earth if he would just bow down and worship him. And so we know that Satan has the ability to give things to people and allow them to operate in like witchcraft and all of this stuff. But not only that, the Bible says that gifts come without repentance, that people can actually operate in the gifts that God has given them. But that does not mean that they're true prophets. And so though even the way that they're judging Joseph Smith is a true prophet is all wrong. And so anytime your theology starts with he has to be a true prophet or this is the first evidence that he is a true prophet because if he was not, how can he do this? That's how Satan has begun people from the beginning. Enjoy the rest of the conversation. Form is the word of God. We know that Joseph Smith was a prophet called to, you know, direct the, the church of Jesus Christ on the earth. And that we know, of course, 
most importantly that that Christ is the Savior. So, if so that makes sense. So, so, so. Okay, I'm tracking you. So you said that you you know that Joseph Smith is a prophet, and this is not me attacking Joseph Smith. I'm really just trying to understand mm -hmm. your 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 worldview. Um, you know that Joseph Smith is a prophet because he was able to translate. Um, uh, the the ancient text into in, into into like you know English and all of these things. Um, so that's that's how you know he's a true it's prophet. A, a fraction of my test, a very small fraction of my testimony, but the, okay. it hinges on this spiritual witness that we'll read about right now. Okay. So I'll read um, verse. Actually, if you want to read verse three, Elder, I'll read verse four. If you want to read verse five. Okay. Um, so it'll be there, there, and there. So he'll okay. <clears throat> Behold, I. I would exhort you that when you shall read these things... Referring to the Book of Mormon. Okay. If you shall read these things, if it be wisdom in God that you should read them, that you would remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men, from the creation of Adam even down until the time that ye shall receive these things, and ponder it in your hearts. And when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you, or advise you, that you would ask God the eternal father in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if he shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And the power of the Holy Ghost, he may know the truth of all things. Okay, so I have a couple of questions, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and so I'm glad you pointed that scripture out because I, I, that's one of the things that I've been wanting to ask you guys. And I'm going to look at this more in depth. But you guys are since you saying that you believe that Joseph Smith is a true prophet um, because by, by essentially praying a prayer and the Holy Spirit revealing it to you. Um, but let me ask you a question. If I came to you right now and say, um, I prayed a prayer and God said that I can um, have sex with my wife, have sex with this woman before marriage, what would you say? I would say that God will not give you a revelation that is contrary to his will or commandments. So that would be. And what would you point to? You would point back to his word. Scriptures. And so that, this, is, this, is, this is one thing I'm trying to reconcile. When I come to you about any claim about regarding sin, righteousness, the way you judge that claim is by pointing back to the word of God. But you guys aren't taught to know if Joseph Smith is a true prophet by the same measure. You told us prayer, prayer. And the Bible in Deuteronomy tells us that that's not the way we judge a prophet. The, the, the Bible tells us that if a prophet proclaims to be a, a man or a woman, a prophet of God, and, and makes a prophecy, and that prophecy does not come to pass, not to fear him. The Bible also tells us that if a prophet claims to speak on behalf of God, but he leads you after other gods, he is not a prophet. And so my thing is, the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitful, right? Who can know it? And so the fact that you guys are taught to pray a prayer to, re to, to know if Joseph Smith is a true prophet. That's, that's but but, but I, that's not the only thing, but, 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 but that is one measure. But I think the way we should judge a prophet is by looking at the word of God, not, not praying a prayer, because I can pray a prayer. And the Bible says that our hearts are, are deceitful above, above else. Who, who, can, who can know it, right? Also, too, one of the things that I, 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 I saw um, in my studies is that um, uh, I think it's in the book of Nephi. Nephi, yeah. Nephi, it says, let me Probably see. Towards the beginning, depending on which book of Nephi you're talking about. There's three, four. Uh, I think it's Nephi versus... Uh, let me, let me get my phone. What? So can I just interject something too? And we don't want to get covered too much today, but it yes, was alluded to earlier that the belief that, that I have and um, people that um, believe the same in our church is that the, the vision that Joseph Smith had where we believe that he saw Jesus Christ and, and God the Father as being two separate and distinct beings. So that may be different than you believe. I'm sorry, I'm, what, what do you mean? So we believe that he um, 
prayed to know which church was right. This was back in 1820 in upstate New York. His parents belonged to different religions and he was trying to decide, you know, there was so much confusion. They'll have a scripture memorized better than I will. Do you want to touch on that now? I mean, to me, as he had this vision and saw... Were well, you talking about Jesus? Saw Jesus, Joseph Smith saw Jesus Christ and God the Father, Heavenly Father, two distinct beings um, that appeared to him. Yeah. So that is a ma major part of my testimony of Joseph Smith is... I believe that that he saw them and that they directed him in the restoration of the church on. So I'm inquisitive. How, how do how do we know, ma'am? How do we know that he saw them? How do we know that to be true? Because when I when I when I researched Joseph Smith, um, speaking of the 1800s, uh, in the 1800s, a, a man died named King Followit, and at his funeral. Um, Joseph Smith, he gets up and says, we have imagined and supposed that God was the God of all of eternity. I refute that idea and take the veils off of your eyes so that we may see that we must all learn to become gods one day. And so Joseph Smith, from my, from my understanding, he believes that, 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 that the God who reigns now was not always the God who reigned, but that God was a man who progressed to Godhood and that we want our, our, our gods who can also progress to Godhood. But in Isaiah 43.10, God says, before me there was no God formed, neither there shall there be gods after me. I'm the first and the last besides me, there is no God. And so King Followit came, um, and the, the King Followit sermon came in the 1800s in the 19th century, but centuries ago, um, you know, years and years and years before then, a couple of thousand years before then, uh, God said in his word that before him there was no God formed, neither should there be gods after him. He's the first and the last. Besides him, there is no God. But the LDS church teaches that there are more than one God and that Jesus and, and, and God was not always the God of all of eternity. He says he refutes that idea. And take the veils off your eyes so that we may see that we must all learn to become gods one day. And so this is the Old Testament. When I look at the, um, the Book of Mormon, the Book of Isaiah is something that the Book of Mormon even coincides with, right? It's several occasions. Several occasions. It's, it's so many scriptures in the Book of Mormon that literally quotes Isaiah from verbatim. But in Isaiah, it's a, I, I feel like that's a clear contradiction. And so which one is true? Is Joseph Smith's words true? That before God, there was no God formed, neither should there be gods after him? Or is Isaiah 43.10 true when it says, before him, there was no God formed, neither should there be gods after him. He's the first and the last. Besides him, there is no God. So you're trying to kind of depict on which one that... I'm just trying to understand. Like, because well, like, when, when I hear that Joseph Smith is a true prophet, I'm trying to reconcile the two. Because if, if he is a true prophet, everybody needs to... But I think the Bible tells us to test the prophet by the what was written previously in God's word. You know, um, not only that, uh, uh, Mormoni was an angel, right? Um, he, um, depending on when you're referring to him. He was, Moroni was the angel that appeared to Joseph Smith and guided him to find the Book of Mormon. But he's also a, a prophet in the Book of Mormon. But look what Galatians 1 and 8 says. It says, but even if an angel from heaven should preach to, to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And so the Bible tells us that, it, that, that and shows us that it's possible for an angel to actually visit you. But if he preaches something different, then what God taught, said previous in his word, let it be a curse. And so I don't think the proof of him being visited by an angel lets us know that he's a prophet because we know that even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, right? And so this is the reason why it says right here in Galatians 1 and 8, but even if an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be a curse. And so, what I'm saying is, so I, 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 I look at Nephi verses 23 and 24, where it says, Which Nephi? Uh, I think it's 2nd Nephi, I'm sorry. Yeah, 2nd Nephi 
25 and 23. And that's why, you know, the other day when I stopped, I'm like, I have some questions for these guys because I want to, you know, I want to know truth. I feel like we all should know truth, right? Second Nephi says, uh, for we are saved by grace through faith after all we can do. That kind of sounds like the book of Ephesians where it says that we're saved by grace through faith and it's not about works, at least any man can boast. So that's another thing that I feel like we have to reconcile it to. If we're saved by grace after all we can do, why does the Bible say that we're saved by grace through faith? It is not of our gift. And so it's basically saying that our, the book of Nephi, second Nephi is saying that, that we're saved by grace after we've done all we can. So let me ask I, you. I, I, I think that kind of sounds like a different gospel. So it, it almost sounds said. like it. It almost sounds like it, but I don't think it, it does. And the reason I say that is, why did God give us commandments? So that we may know him essentially. Are we to follow those commandments? Yeah, of course. But I think... What happens if we don't follow those commandments? I think if we don't follow those commandments, I think it's, it's, it's proof that we don't know him. And what would happen to us then after this life? We, won't, we, will, we will spend eternity separated from God. That's what I believe. That's like, I think that's what the scriptures. And we believe that as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But those are works, right? So you're following commandments. You're actually doing things to indicate that you believe in God. Mm -hmm. And you believe in his work. Those are works. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But those works, those works. Those works won't save you. Yeah. Okay. However, if you don't do those works, you won't be saved. No, no, I, was, I, I, think, I, think this, I think that's a fundamental difference that we have. I don't think that's what the Bible is saying. I don't think that, because I, I, think, I, think I think that's a contradiction with all due respect. I don't mean to disrespect my elders, but I think what the scripture is saying is if you don't have evidence of good works, it's proof that you never had faith to begin with. Mm -hmm. It's not saying that if you don't do the works, you won't be saved because Jesus came and did the work for us. And when Jesus gives us his spirit, his spirit empowers us to do works. And this is why the Bible says that we know a good tree by the fruit it produces. That if the tree is not producing apples, it's not an apple tree. If the person is not producing good works, he's not a Christian. That's what he's saying. It said the, the spirit. And so this is the reason why Ephesians says that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is not of our works. In fact, the Bible says that our works is filthy rags and the Greek is scubalon. It means what they used to wipe their butts with. Right. The Bible also says that faith without works is dead. Well, that and also in, in Revelation it says that we'll be judged according to our works. So when people ask if we're judged by grace or works, I say both. Well, 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 well. Which, like, so I, 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 I put it this way. I think it's a difference between somebody saying, I'm going to judge you according to your works because I'm judging you based on the finished work of Christ working in you and you doing something in order to be accepted. So when it's a difference because I think essentially the, a Christian should display good works because our works is worship. Our works is not works that we, that, we, that we muster up to, to, to gain any salvation. I think that's a difference. And so the Christian works is worship. And so when it says that we're saved by grace through faith after all we can do, that is a contradiction. I think what, what Ephesians 2.8 says, that we're saved by grace through faith and it's, up, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's not of our works, at least any man can boast, right? And so, and so it's not saying that if, it, that, that if we don't work, we don't have faith. It is saying that if we don't have work, our faith was never alive to begin with. And so, and, and so this is the reason why the Bible says that Jesus was sent into the world, right, to, to live a life that we can live on our own and to die a death that we, we deserve. And when the, when you remember when the, when the, when the disciples um, was sad that Jesus would come, he said, you know, you know don't be sad because if I, if I don't leave, I won't be able to send the helper. And so, so what happens is, I, I, the, way I, the way I look at it is like this. Uh, just imagine, f just, just for the sake of your imagination, just imagine you're, you're a two liter soda, uh, uh, you're a two liter soda, uh, 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 soda bottle, right? And the soda inside is good works, right? If, if we do what, what Nephi, second Nephi tells us to do, that we're saved by grace after all we can do, which is every time we want good works to come out of us, we manually pour this good works out. God said that type of works, 
I don't want. If it's after all you can do, the Bible says that any man who add on to the finished work of Christ, let that, let that man be a, a curse. But I think what the Holy Spirit does, you ever seen those YouTube videos where the Mentos goes inside the soda can and he shakes it up and the, and, and the soda just pours out on his own? I think when the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, that's what the Holy Spirit does. Something inside of us changes. In the same way something inside that soda bottle changed chemically, which allowed soda to come out. And so when I do good works, it is not by my own doing. It is the Holy Spirit empowering me to do so. Something happened, a change happened inside of me. It is nothing that I did. Can I ask how that change comes about? How that change come about? I think that change comes about by believing that Jesus Christ is, is, is the Messiah, believing that God raised him from the dead, by turning from your sin and repenting of your sin and putting your hope in what Jesus did for you on the cross. The Bible says that if you confess God with your mouth and believe that Christ raised him from the dead and turn from your sin, that he will give you the right to be called sons and daughters of God. And then he will give you his Holy Spirit and those good works flow out of the new nature that you have been given, not after all we can do. What you and just so, said is exactly what we believe, actually. Well, well, well. Tur like, if, like, for our definition of like turning away from our sins and repenting and developing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, those are the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. So that's us exercising our faith, which you could also say is a work. Because if you're repenting, that means you're following the commandments. That means you're actually putting forth an effort to turn away from the sins of the world. So you could say that's a work, but that's also what develops the change because God and Jesus Christ want us to, you know, to have that change, become a new creature. And that comes through, you know, obviously by the grace of Jesus Christ. I think we're saying, and I follow you. I think we're saying, I think we're kind of saying the same thing. I think the, the, the end conclusion is a little different because I think that we're, I think you're t interpreting it as a work and I just believe that the Bible says that if any man add on to the finished work of Christ, let that, that, that work be, uh, let that man be a curse. That Jesus doesn't want some of our work plus Christ's work. He doesn't want any of our works. He says our works is filthy. Right? He doesn't want any of your works as it pertains to your salvation. Not saying that your works, not saying that, that you don't have good works. That's not what I'm saying. A Christian has to have good works. But he's not saying that the works that you have pertains to your salvation. Jesus came and finished the work on your behalf. And salvation is a gift. And once you receive the gift of salvation, God gives you a new heart and you have good works that flow out of that. It's a difference by saying, that's a difference to what I, I believe 2 Nephi verses 23, 24 says, where it says that we're saved by grace after all we can do. See, that, I don't that. see a contradiction at all. Really? No, because if you, re if you look at this verse alone and kind of isolate it. So what is the after all we can do part? Explain that to me. If you see that, then the after all we can do part is like you said, it's a gift. And it's, if I'm going to give you a gift, I'm going to give you this. I'll hold it out as long as I want. But if you don't grab it, it's not yours. You have the choice to either take it or not. Kind of like what you said with, you know, salvation. But that's completely, gift. completely. So if salvation is a gift and I give you a gift... Right, that's completely different than saying, oh, receive the gift. And then saying that we're saved by grace after we do something first. That's, I think that's completely different. Because Correct me if I'm wrong. after your change of heart. Okay. Okay. So you go through a process to have your heart changed, right? And what... Well, it does God do it, though. I can do it. Understandable, but you're, you're choosing to to do things based off of that change of heart. Someone else could have a similar experience and turn around and say, fish posh. No, do my See, I think that's different. When I first became a Christian, I remember the first time I had the opportunity to lie. It's, it's of course, I made a conscious decision not to lie, but it was, it was not me, 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 me making a conscious decision for the first because time. Christ had changed your heart. Right. And so, and so, and so, and so, and so that's, that's all I'm saying. We're probably going to, we're probably getting into, into semantics. I, I don't want to like be nitpicky, but, 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 but. But that, you're, but all of us make mistakes every day, don't we? Yeah. Our hearts are good. We want to do good, but we still make mistakes. So we're still striving to become like Christ. We're still striving to perform 
Christ-like actions. So you guys, also, but, uh, let me ask you a question. Do you guys think, so I've read that, okay, I'm but sorry, I cut you off. I'm, now, I'm sorry, I apologize. But even after everything that we do, Christ is the only one who paid the ultimate price, which will allow us to return to his presence and God the eternal father. He went into the garden of Gethsemane and took upon himself the price of all of our sins because we are daily sinners. Amen. Even though we try to, to do good things, we still make mistakes. And so even after all of those things, at the end of the day, if our heart has been changed and we are repenting after everything, we still sin. Christ compensates for that. And through his grace, we're able to return to live with him again. Well, I, see, and, and see, here's the thing. That's so beautiful what you just said. You said it so eloquently, you know, I, and, I, and I believe what you said. But, it, but that's what that says as well. But, but, but also, too, it's another, okay, let's, let's go. The Book of Mormon, I, right? Mormon, I, verse 10, 32. I think it just, I, I think it kind of comes against what you just lay, laid out so beautifully. Verse Mormon, I, um, um, chapter 10, verse 32, it says, Yet come unto Christ and be perfected in him. And deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourself of un all ungodliness and love with all your might uh, and strength, then his grace is sufficient for you. Mm -hmm. Then his grace is sufficient because for you. Because we have gone through and had that change of heart. Got it. And so, I, I, so maybe you can explain this to me, right? Is, is, if, is, grace, is, is Jesus Christ's grace sufficient for you? It is after everything I can do because of that change of heart. But right here it says that if you purge yourself of all ungodliness, have you purged yourself of all, all ungodliness? I'm trying. So his grace isn't sufficient for you yet? His grace is sufficient if I put in all of the effort to change, yes. I, so so even, if, even what you just said, I'm, I'm, it's just different from what this said. Listen to what it said again. It says, yet come to Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourself of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourself of all ungodliness and the love of God with your might, and with, with, your, with your might, mind, and strength, then his grace is sufficient for you. Isn't and that so, what you're trying to do though? That's no, what I'm trying to do. I know, look, I, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is, you would say, and I think all of you say, that no, Christ's grace is sufficient for you. But this right here says that the only way Christ's grace can be for sufficient for you if you are perfect. It makes me think of Matthew 548. Be therefore for perfect. As I am perfect. Your Father is perfect. Yeah. It's a pretty daunt. You cannot do that while you're on earth. But if you think about it, I kind of think about this, like be therefore perfect eventually. You know, you'll eventually be you know, perfected and reach that, well, the end goal that we're Oh, uh, so that's for. how you interpret this eventually? Because so oh, okay, the internal aspect of it, but not just like right now. It's like, because I'm not perfect, I'm not gonna receive the grace of Christ. It's not true. Okay, okay. So that kind of makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that makes sense. And I, I, I think what, what confuses me though, and what confused me, and if, if that's the way you interpret it, may, maybe, but what it says, be perfect in him and deny yourself of all ungodliness. If we are perfected, there is no need to deny us of all, of all ungodliness because in our glorified bodies, we don't have to deny anything. We're, we're already made perfect, right? And so this is showing me that this is not talking about our glorified state, but this is talking about our earthly state. Right. And so yet come unto Christ and be perfect and be per perfected. perfected unto him. How long does it take to be like perfected in something? Right. Like over time. I get sanctification is a process. Mm -hmm. But this is saying that if I, I think this is giving earthly, um, uh, you know, implications, because if we are already if we already have received our glorified body, there's no need for this command to even be, be given, right? I'll look at it this way. So it's telling us like what we need to do. You know, the end goal is, you know, be perfected. It takes time. Okay. And it's saying, you know, deny yourself of all ungodliness. That's like, I see that as like repentance. Like you're de denying yourself of things that are ungodly, but that's like a process. Like we said, like we all like slip up sometimes. We gotcha. Mistakes. So that's kind of saying like 
how we become perfected is by continuing to deny ourselves of all ungodliness. But, 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 but right, and then it says perfected unto him and deny yourself of all ungodliness. And yet, if you shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and the love of God with all your might, mind, and strength, then his grace is sufficient for you. That's, that, that's something different than what Ephesians says, that we are saved by grace through faith, for it is not of our works, least any man can boast. And so if his grace is sufficient for you. So I spent the rest of my time with him trying to explain Joseph Smith has made some, some faulty claims and some concerning things that the LDS church should pay attention to. When Isaiah already told us that before God, there was no God formed, neither should there be gods after him, that he's the first and the last, there is no God, right? A lot of times the LDS members would try to say, well, no, it's not talking about God Almighty, it's talking about lowercase g's. But if he was just merely talking about lowercase gods and not God Almighty's or um, gods who will rule this earth one day, he wouldn't have compared that with him. He, he wouldn't say before me there was no God form, neither should there be gods after me. He's clearly comparing these gods with himself. And he's saying, no, I'm the only God who has ever reigned and I'm the only God who will ever reign. But when you dig a little and you research the LDS teaching, they believe that the God who reigns on this earth, the God who rules this earth, was not the God that always ruled this earth, but it was God before him, and that there will be gods after them. And that's a clear, and that is a clear contradiction of what Isaiah says. And so really, I'm just trying to hold them accountable to what the ancient text says and how the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith contradicts that. Um, and so this is what you see right now. Hope you are still enjoying the video. The, the, therefore, why do you have to deny yourself of all ungodliness in order for his grace to be sufficient for you? Why is his grace is not sufficient before you before you do it? I think there's they're saying the same things, but I think the way it's like it's like I'm not going to say the wording, but it's saying that as we follow the teachings of Christ, like being able to you know pursue the what this is talking about. That's that's how, that's kind of the same thing of what the Bible teaches too is that we can't just like not do anything like not not follow any of the commandments or just like be disobedient and sin all the time. That's not gonna allow us to be back in the presence of the Father. But you know, doing what this says and what we've been talking about, we can live with God again, and we do that by exercising faith, repentance. You know, the five steps of the gospel being like the faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost endure to the end like that's what christ taught if we do that even though we're not going to be perfect we follow that that's how we are being cleansed of our sins that's how we deny ourselves of all ungodliness and it's not saying like then the grace is extended no the that, that no extended. that's actually literally what it said i'm not even trying to put words in the book of mormon's mouth it literally says um after you cleanse yourself of all ungodly and it says some it says all ungodliness then his grace is sufficient for you. And so there, so if, if there's no, like, there's but no way, you, the, the Bible that. says, the Bible says that if a man on this earth says that he isn't without sin, that that man, that man is a liar, right? right? That he doesn't know God. So we're all, right? But this is what I don't understand. That if we cleanse ourselves of un, all ungodliness, then his grace is sufficient for you. you, what you something you also take an account for too is like the rest of the Book of Mormon as you kind of see the, the context, not the context, but like it explains it in kind of many, you know, different ways. It'll kind of come together of like what we're, we're trying to say as a whole. So if you like single out like a, a verse and like pay attention to like the, the wording and kind of have that hinge everything rather than like everything that's been said in the Book of Mormon, then we can see that's, that. That's fair because it, the, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a narrative, right? And so to read one part, right? But I think that some things is clear, right? If it says then his grace is sufficient for you, I, that, that's what I didn't understand. So when I read that, I'm like, huh, you know, um, that just kind of stuck out to me. And so when I see things that I've, that, that I've read in the Bible, they kind of sound similar, but, it, but, but, it, but, it's, but it's different, you know? And so we don't have to keep, that's just something that I, I feel like, man, maybe, maybe you guys can, if you come again, we could talk about it again once you, once you looked at, over it. But I, I think one of the questions that I asked before, that if, that if Isaiah 43 says, before him there was no God form, neither shall be God. 
the King Follett sermon. Yeah, how can how how can how can we then reconcile Joseph Smith's words by 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 saying that God is not the God of all of eternity? That there were gods before him. When the Book of Isaiah, and we we've already said that you know the Book of Mormon beautifully quotes Isaiah. Do we not see that as a contradiction? That that before him there was no God form, neither should there be gods after him. He's the first and the last. Besides him, there is no God. Then you know, a man coming thousands of years later in the 19th century, in a in a in a in, in a man's funeral, saying, "I refute that idea and take the eyes off your and take the veils off your eyes that we may see that we must all learn to become gods one day. That there were gods before this God, and there will be gods after." Right. How can I'm, we? How can we? How can we reconcile that? Those two, because because to me those two seem to clash with one another. They seem right. to clash. And that's something like what was said in the the King Fault sermon. It's something I still have a question about. And there's kind of there's a lot of different elements we can think about, and all a lot of like loose ends we don't have the answers to. So we can't really like, for me at least, like put like a conclusion on oh that exactly means this or whatever. I'd still need to look more into it. But the reason it doesn't damage my, my testimony of it is because I know that the Book of Mormon is the word of God and I've received that from a spiritual witness that it's true. And with so many other things as well, like adding to my testimony that uh, I, I have come to a knowledge of it that it's true and I can't explain it all at once. But even when we have questions, like they're kind of, I like to think of it like this. We have like a tree like the trunk being like like the foundational like beliefs like you know God is our heavenly Father, Jesus is the Christ, all these you know different things. Then there's kind of like the leaves and the branches that are kind of appendages, like you say, and like sometimes someone says this like maybe it doesn't sound quite right, you know. Then there's just different things that that come out that way. But if we come to the fundamental beliefs that you know God's our heavenly Father, Jesus is the Christ, and you know if we follow what Christ teaches, we can live with him again. And then there, I think that's right now, that's kind of a, a branch or an appendage that I'm still trying to kind of work through, but it does not phase my testimony that I know that, that what we share is true. Well, one of the reasons why I stopped you guys, I have a couple of um, LDS friends. I never really had like um, deep conversation with them, but they was like, if you see some elders, stop them. <laughs> you know? and. Um, wanted to stop you guys and, and, to, and, to, and to, you know, um, and to ask you guys questions because I believe that God has revealed himself um, through the Holy Scriptures. And if a man comes and says something different, so when I started to research, and I just say this with love, I don't, I don't mean to disrespect you. Yeah, you guys are so kind, so, such nice people, such nice pe people. And I don't ever want you guys to think that I'm attacking your faith. But I think that if we are reading the word that, con that, that, that contradicts what God previously said in his word, that might be a danger of we're preaching the wrong gospel. And I don't want you, I don't I don't want that guys for you, but also I don't want to attack you for your faith. I want you to be able to answer the questions for me, and I don't want to assume anything out of ignorance, mm -hmm. right? Maybe you can ask ask them because I don't want to be arrogant, right? And I don't want to be like, oh, I I have absolute truth, and I don't want to hear nothing you have to say. I think no, that's I, I think that. I, I think that's yeah, I think that's arrogant. But if if God is saying something previous in His Word, and then Joseph Smith comes and says something differently. You know, and the LDS church is saying something differently, regardless of what you think happened. We have to reconcile, we have to try to reconcile the two and say, let's pause here. Let's try to, like you just said, you can answer those questions, but you knew that when you prayed a prayer, that the Holy Spirit revealed to you that Joseph Smith is a true prophet. But there's some, there's questions that I, that's a really, really great fundamental question. This man is the prophet of the church. And so if he's false, I think we have to question, you know, the things that he's saying. We have to test the things that he say with the word of God. So that's the only thing that I'm doing. Not because I want to attack you. I respect you guys. You guys seem like nice people. But I want to, I want to, I want all of us to come into the acknowledgement of the truth because I think it's important. And just out of love for you guys, you know, I was like, let me, let me let these guys speak for themselves. Let me not attack them for their faith. 
But I want to speak for myself because I believe God has revealed himself. And so when we, when we see things in the word of God that contradicts, I think, what God revealed to him about himself, that before him there was no gods formed, neither should there be gods after him. If a prophet comes and says something contrary to what God said in his Old Testament, I think we have to first raise, raise questions. Not only that, I did some reading and you guys believe that Jesus and Lucifer are spiritual brothers. Well, that contradicts what John 1 says, that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and the word was God, and through him all things were made. And without him, not one thing was made that was made. So if Jesus made all things, including Lucifer, how is Jesus and Lucifer spiritual brothers? Well, in the context that we are all spiritual brothers, you know, like Isaiah says that Lucifer is a, this is all a whole nother rabbit hole, but Isaiah was a, or not Isaiah, Lucifer was a fallen angel, the son of the morning. But he was created. As we were all created. Too. But Jesus created him. So Jesus created his brother. So there's a whole, now that's something that I'm, it's kind of depends on like what you're looking at is created. It's this whole another rabbit hole that it would go into. No, because I, because, because, because what I read is that you guys believe that God Almighty had relations with Mary and Jesus and, and Lucifer was the offspring of, J Jesus and Lucifer were the offspring, right? Of God and Mary. Mary? I, that's, no, so, no, 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 So no, as, no, no, as no, Sister Bristol true. was describing a little earlier, as she was recounting what we refer to as the first vision, which is when God and Christ came to visit Joseph Smith. He had a vision where there were two individuals. So whereas you believe there's one God and there are three representations of that God. We believe that there is God the Father, who is the Father of us all, Jesus Christ being his begotten Son. Mm -hmm. I believe that too. Okay, two separate individuals. So, no, I, so what I think the Christian church has historically taught is that there's one God. That's correct. Who, but, That's but, what... but they exist in three co equal persons, yes. not, not, and so, and we believe in three separate entities. Right. God the Father, one person. God the Son, as a separate person, mm -hmm. not a representation of God the Father. No, we believe that too. We as a separate entity. No, so so when you say entity, I, what I'm saying is that we believe that there is one God in nature. God, Jesus Christ, two beings. Right. Two separate beings. No. So when Christ came down to earth. Was his heavenly father, God the Father, up in heaven watching him on earth? So, 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 so there's one being of God that share, they share the same nature, but they're three separate co equal persons. It's a difference. And so, one being of God who share the same nature of, uh, as God, but they exist to three co equal persons. And so, when Jesus was on earth, he condescended and became a man. He was praying to his heavenly father who was in heaven, who was also God. <laughs> and so, and so, and so, and so I, I don't believe. So God's children mm -hmm. include all of us, Jesus Christ, who was his son. So you believe Jesus Christ created all things? We believe that under God, Jesus Christ was the creator of the world. Yes, but we are all spiritual children of our heavenly father. Got you. Well, well, it says, but but it also says that Jesus, God, um, Jesus is is God in the Bible. It says that He's eternal. That He does not have a beginning. That He was not created, but He 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 existed forever ago. That He was. This this is this is the reason why He says, "Before Abraham was, I am." Um, he, that means uh, ego, ego in me into eternity's past forever ago. So we, we know the only one that is eternal is God. This is the reason why the Pharisees sought to kill him. It's because they said, you being man, make yourself equal with God. And so he was claiming to be God. He was claiming to be eternal. He wasn't cl claiming to be... Um, he was uh, claiming to be the son of God. Well, well, well yeah, the son of God who was also one with his father god right even in the one with the same purpose yes so you not you, one in the same body 
No, no, not the, no, because God is, God is a spiritual being. They can be separated. They, can, they, they don't have to share the same body to share the same nature as God. God doesn't exist like us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, who you are and what you are is all wrapped up into one being, which is Elder Bristle, right? Um, who God is, God doesn't exist like us. He's one God in nature, but we see that expressed through three co-equal persons. And so this is the reason why, so when Jesus claimed to be, when he says before Abraham was, I, I am, the Pharisees did not mistake him for um, saying that I am the father. They knew he wasn't the father. They, 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 they sought to kill him because he claimed to be equal, equally God with the father. And so he wasn't just claiming to be begotten of the son as a, as a created being. Even if the word um, begotten in the Greek, it means monogamous theos. It means the unique and one of a kind God. It does not mean someone who was created, right? And so this is the reason why the Pharisees wanted to kill him because he was seeking, he was claiming to be God almighty. And so this is the reason why the Pharisee says, how are you? How, how are you saying before Abraham I was? You're not even 50 years old because he was in his 30s. And so he was claiming to be eternal. And we know the only one that is eternal is God. Right. And so this is the reason why in John it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Through him, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that was made. And then verse 14 of John, it says the word became flesh and did what? dwelt among us, right? And so Jesus became flesh and dwelt, God became flesh and dwelt among us, not a created being, someone who has existed into eternity's past. He's the eternal God, right? And so I'm not, I'm not saying that God and the Father share the same body, that God and the Father are the same person, but I believe that they share the same essence. And this is the reason why the Pharisees wanted to kill him because God's essence is distinct. He cannot share his essence with any created being. And so this is the reason why Jesus was killed on, on the cross. He was, he was accused of blasphemy. Now we notice in the scriptures, they didn't kill Jesus from a misunderstanding. They didn't misunderstand what he was saying. They killed Jesus because they didn't believe it. <laughs> they didn't believe what he was saying. He was claiming to be eternal. He was threatening the Pharisees and Sadducees like authority in place. He Not was, even authority. Was blasphemy in essence. Bla so. what, what, what was the blasphemous thing? Because he was claiming to be the son of God, of deity. Well, well, see, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. Um, the son of God, like, the son of God is... Jehovah, okay? That's who he was saying that he was. We believe right. that Christ was the God of Jehovah, the Old Testament. the God of the Old Testament. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. Yes. Correct. Right. And so, and so, and so... And that, to them, was blasphemy. And so, is, is God the, uh, is the God of the Old Testament the God Almighty? That is Jesus Christ, Jehovah. It's not God the Father. Christ has done everything under the direction of the Father. Gotcha. And he has a father, just so, like I have a father. So there's two Alpha and Omegas? I'm, 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 I'm trying to get understand. Do you guys believe Jesus that there's... Jesus Christ is the God of this world who created the world under God's direction. So we worship Jesus Christ as the God of this world. And so they're gods of other worlds. You're getting into a different <laughs> area, so let's and not And it can get that. confusing, I think, in the scriptures because God sometimes can refer to um, God the Father, right? And sometimes the Son, but the term Jehovah, at least, we know to be Christ, right? But Yeah, but, but, but also in the Old Testament, God, God the Father is referred to as Jehovah. Right, and so this is the reason why it was blasphemous because it was not a blasphemous thing to say that you are a son of God. It's a blasphemous thing to make yourself equal with God. And so they did not say, we wanna kill you because you claim to be the son of God. They said, we wanna kill you because you make yourself, e you being a man, make yourself equal with God. That is a blasphemous thing. Well, I guess thing. that's an interpretation of what they were saying. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, okay. Well, well, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe we, we can just drop that, you know. Um, I, I believe that Jesus was claiming to be God Almighty, and there's only one God. This is the reason why Isaiah 43, 10 says, Before me there was no God formed, neither there shall be gods after me. I am the first and the last besides me. 
there is no God. And so I believe that he's saying that it's one God in nature, but the way he is expressed is through three co-equal persons. So this is the reason why in Genesis we see that God created the earth, but we see the triune God of scripture all actively involved in creation. We see the Father is the one who initiates. We see the Son who's the one who creates. We see the Holy Spirit is the one who hovers over the face of the deep, solidifying all that God has made. So one God in nature who expresses itself to three co-equal persons. And so, uh, yeah, thank you guys for talking to me. I mean, we can talk all, we, we can talk we can all day. You, you, have a know, you know your scriptures well, so it's very interesting. I, I, would love, I would love for you guys, if you guys ponder on what I said, uh, and you guys want to come back, just give me a call. I would love to have a conversation with you guys again. I don't want to keep you guys all day. I, I, just, I just all want us to, 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 to make sure that what we, what we know and what we teach is correct. It's because I think that God will judge us um, based on what we teach, right? Um, the Bible says that teachers will be judged with a harsher judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if it's things in the Book of Mormon that contradict what God has said in his word, years before um, the, the, the prophet Joseph Smith came, I, I just think that, you know, maybe that's something for you guys to chew on. And if you guys think that I'm wrong, come back and have another conversation with me. And I'd love to talk to you guys. Yeah. We, we definitely love you know, having this conversation with you. And just so you know as well, is like our purpose as missionaries is to not only like have these conversations and, and you know, answers, answer questions and things like that, but we help people to come to know that the things that we have shared are true and to eventually help them um, take steps towards you know, getting baptized. So we help people eventually um, come into the fold after they know um, that that they've come to know it's true. So that's also something that we, that's kind of what we do as missionaries. Cool. So you know, so. All right. Well, man, you guys are very kind people. I had a lot of irritating questions for, for you guys and you guys no, sat here. You know, hopefully you, you felt honored and respected in my house. I want everybody to feel honored and respected in my house. I, res I respect you guys' as diligence and you guys, you know, dedication Likewise. to what you believe, what you, what you, what you, what you believe to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and so, man, I'll, I'll try to be continue to be faithful like you guys. I think a lot of, a lot of people can learn from you guys and your faithfulness. And so appreciate it. I hope you guys pray a prayer the, of, of the things that I said. And maybe God can maybe reveal some things to you, you know, and I'll just continue, I'll continue to ponder and think about what you guys said to me and, you know. Man, thank you guys for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. One thing I really tried to do in this video is to honor and respect them. One, because they're in my home. And I believe that God is not just pleased in how we present truth, but how we present truth. That if we present the truth in a garbage bag, people didn't reject the truth. They reject the way you gave it to them. And so one thing I tried to do is I tried to give them truth on a dignifying platter and not a garbage bag so they wouldn't have any reason to reject the truth that I was giving to them. But also too, man, I, I want us to pray for them. I want us to continue to pray um, for the LDS church um, because at the end of the day, they're not our enemies. They are people who I believe have a false doctrine and we have to find out how to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves and lovingly give the truth to the LDS church so God will call some of them into our fold. And so, man, I hope you enjoyed this video. Be on the lookout for more videos with Preston Perry, where we live and love truth. And remember, y'all always be bold. Peace.